Oh, that's very good. I can still just tell you what you Yes, we're due to be recording. There we are recording. Perfect. So after this, all presentations will be available via recordings as well, which is anything you want to look back at. So um, start off, my name is Alan Glynn. I am the Highland Park Ambassador here in Ireland. And um, we're going to take you on a little taste to your, to your true, true your two samples and a little understanding of the Highland Park distillery. Um, very, very storied distillery. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll taste as we go along. Uh, I'll tell you when you can kind of take a look at sample one and sample two. Feel free if you want to have a little sniff or a nose or a taste of them yourselves. Never going to stop you. Um, but I'll kind of come back to it as we go along as well. So we're just going to talk about the three things that really make Highland Park uh, proudly stand apart. Highland Park known, as, with, known for our phrases of Viking honour and our Viking heritage. And to understand that, you have to understand the location, the people, and the whiskey itself. So when we look at the location first, and this gives you a real understanding of Highland Park and its storied history, we are located in the Orkney Islands, so at the very, very tip top uh, of Scotland in, in, from its north. The Orkney Islands themselves is actually made up of 70 different islands, and of those 70 islands, only 21 of them are inhabited. It also actually houses um, the shortest flight in the world, as you see up here in the top, if you see up the top north or top left there from Westray to the neighboring island. All of the islands themselves actually, as we said, only 21 of them are inhabited. Most of the others are all um, full of sheep. <laughs> um, sorry, no moment. Just as I'm letting people in, I keep losing my control on the presentation. Um, so I'm saying, of the 70 islands, uh, 21,000 people live here and only 21 of the islands themselves are actually inhabited. Um, it's in, in masses over 380 square miles. So being its location up the tip top north of Scotland, it's quite barren, it's quite cool, it's quite cold. Um, and the islands themselves were actually inhabited by the Vikings and the Normans for a very long time until Scotland took control. So there was a real kind of battle to do with the island as well for its control. So that's where we take our Viking heritage and our Viking story from. And to understand that, we get an image of the island itself. So beautiful. That in Ireland, I don't think we're ever um, surprised by seeing such beautiful scenery, but it's always amazing to see such amazing scenery as well, to see how the land, how, how the land gets sculpted by the sea. And up here, it's a lot more evident than we will see in a lot of places in Ireland. And it's the people that really make this island as well. They're very, very proud of their hiking heritage, Viking heritage. You wouldn't really, they wouldn't consider themselves as Scots. They wouldn't consider themselves as uh, Vikings. They do, they are their own selves. They are from the Orkney Islands. And um, this is actually, the people really embody the, the, the feeling that it actually is to be from the Orkney Islands. There's a very um, famous game called the Ba, which is kind of a precursor to what we call rugby where you have the Doonies and the Uppies, where they play every year um, with a kind of a sheep's, a ball made from a sheep's um, skin, where they fight across the island um, to try and gain control of, uh, of the bar. And they really embody their real heritage and their story. But for the distillery itself and for what we're talking about with Highland Park, founded in 1798 by a man called Magnus Jonsson, he was a flesher and a preacher by day and a smuggler by night. Now, Magnus Jonsson was actually arrested for his illegal activities of uh, smuggling alcohol and the distillery itself uh, was taken over by the local sheriff um, or the local police captain who actually started to run the distillery himself for a long period of time after he took it back from Magnus Jonsson. 
and he really it, it became a part of the story. So when Magnus was actually released, he went back and started working in the distillery again, and that which became the distillery um, that we have here in Highland Park. Uh, so what I'm going to say now is, as we talk through the distillery and we talk through the actual distillation process and our process in making our whiskey, what I'll ask is that we, you can take a look at sample number one, please. So what I'd like you to do is have a nose, have a taste as I talk, and then when we come to the end of talking about the distillery, we'll have a little discussion about the whiskey itself. One thing I will say, and a lot of you are experienced whiskey uh, tasters, um, when you are trying to get your nose, don't bury your nose in the glass, just let it pass over. This is a 40% ABV, ABV whiskey, so when we are nosing it, what we're going to get is we're going to get body and we're going to get the ethanol. That ethanol can actually burn your nose and burn your uh, smell receptors. So as you're doing it, just pass it by you more than sticking your nose in it. And it will stop you from, because you've got a lot of whiskey to taste as well today. So we don't want to ruin up that nose. We want to keep you fresh as long as we can. So the distillery itself, oh, something else coming in here now, one moment. The distillery itself, as we said, founded by Magnus Ewenson in the Hillary area known as the High Park. And the reason he actually founded the distillery in this space was that he wanted to uh, keep a lookout to make sure that the tax collectors um, and customers arriving into Kirkwall, he could see all the customers arriving into Kirkwall by boat. He could see everything that was going on around him. Since then, there's not, not much has changed in the way of the Highland Park. It's been made the same way for the last 220 years. And its defining features are really in its production and um, are really in its production and how it's made. One sec now, this has decided to just freeze up on me. Here we go. So with our production, we do use, um, so Scotland being famous as we we'll call for peated malt, we do use about 10% of our malt is peated uh, to a PPM of about average 38 to 45. So what you're gonna find is it's majority um, unmalted barley, but that little bit of malted barley really kind of adds something to it. Um, and it adds that little bit of flavor, adds that little bit of smoke, adds that little peat to us. We take care of all malting on site and um, we do uh, all our unmalted barley is not uh, is delivered to the site um, and then we actually grow our own um, barley for our malting and it's all handled on site by hand within our own kilns in, on, in the Highland Park. As you can see here from our, from our processes going on, small little videos is to give you an idea of what's going on in the distillery from our malt kilns. Uh, we're then going to process into our mash tun, which is going to come into our uh, fermentation tanks, which is going to come into our, uh, our wash stills and our um, spirit stills. All the kind of as you would find in a general distillery. Nothing that I can say is anything in specific or uh, over the top in what we're doing as in our distill ocean processes. We use a wet yeast, which is a little bit different from using a dry yeast. It helps kind of mix in with your, with your uh, mash tun to create our fermentation process. Um, what really kind of makes us stand apart is that peat we're talking about and is in the barley we're talking about um, by our malting process. And uh, something that's quite original to Highland Park that gives us that original type of flavour is we have treeless peat. There are no real trees to speak of in the Orkney Islands. So it, the layers of peat um, are fog, yarfi and um, moss. But this wood, this peat, is kind of a very heather heavy peat. So it gives real kind of sweetness, gives real kind of floral aromas to it. All the peat itself at age is grown for an average of about 3,000 years. Now, we are coming to the end of what's called our Hoverster Moor, which is our main source right now, but we've got plenty of other space and bogs within the islands um, to be able to create, our, uh, to be able to, um, to be able to, I'm losing my mind right now, <laughs> to be able to malt our barley. Jeez, couldn't even think of the words there. All peat is actually cut on the island between May and June. So you actually find that the guys that work in the distillery will actually go out and aid the guys on, and on the land to actually cut the peat to make sure we have enough for the year. But it's this really original style of peat. It's very, very, uh, so it's a heather kind of style of peat. Very sweet, very kind of floral. Really kind of creates that nose and really creates that flavour within the whiskey. And there's a little image of the guys working in Hobbiston Moor. I think in Ireland, uh, we kind of generally understand the process when it comes to peat, because I think a lot of us have spent a day or two on the bog where we understand the backbreaking work that's in it and turning peat and foot and, foot and peat as we go. And as you can see, we, have, we operate four stills, two uh, wash and two uh, spirit stills um, within the distillery, all copper pot. So as we're talking about the 12-year-old, 
reason I was saying that was to kind of give you an idea of the production processes and the pizza. You kind of start to get the initial kind of flavors coming through here. So this is our first proprietary release in, in 1979. It really is kind of the, the, the spearhead for Highland Park. It's, we have a 10 year old, but this is the one that we would recommend people really to kind of look at. So as we take it on our nose, we take that real kind of heather honey, as my watch kicking in, we take it as that real heather honey, real kind of rich fruit. We're aging this whiskey in predominantly uh, European sherry cask, and then we're using a, a minority of American oak cask. So we're, that European sherry oak cask, we're gonna get those rich kind of fruit cakes, those sultanas, those raisins coming through. And then in our taste, we do get quite a bit of that piece. It's quite aromatic, but as I was saying, like for me personally, and you know, when we're all doing these types of tastings, we all do taste differently. So if I'm saying one thing and you're not fully getting it, it doesn't mean that you're wrong or I'm right. We do all taste differently, but I do get that quite sweetness, that kind of heather, that floralness coming through, and even kind of a bit of clove on it as well. I hope we're all enjoying it anyway as we go. Unfortunately, I can't see you all as I'm talking, so I'm hoping everybody's still there. So saying this at a 40% ABV, gives us a really nice body, has a really nice color uh, coming through in it. Um, and it gives us something quite different um, with that head, with that Hobbiston or with that Heather honey coming through from that piece. It adds a very different kind of bold sort of flavor style to it. So as we continue on, what really kind of helps us stand apart as well and what we're doing is our casks. And our cask policy is very, very important to us. So being that we are a brand of Edrington, it gives us something that's quite different. Now, I don't, I'm not gonna try and rush people along. If you're enjoying your 12 year old, enjoy your 12 year old. Um, even before I move on, what I'm gonna do, oh, one more person coming in here, guys, apologies. I'm just gonna double check now just to make sure that we have nothing in our chat as we go. Because unfortunately, I, it just doesn't pop up for me as easily as when I'm talking. Yeah, have you there, guys, chat. Okay. Pat, as Scotch whiskey, as Scotch goes, I think smoke here is quite subtle. I, I, I would agree with you massively, Pat, like, it, Paul, sorry, Paul. I would agree with you massively, Paul. Um, it is quite light, but you're saying, as we were saying, using only about 10% of our malt being peated and at such a low uh, PPM, um, it really kind of does true come quite lightly, kind, kind of sweet, and it gives you those kind of floral notes as I was talking about as well. Um, is Hobbiston more peat used in any other distillery and where is the barley malted? We malt the barley on site in the distillery. Um, and is this peat used for any other distillery? No, it's not. The other, so as Edrington, as a company, we have uh, whiskey wise, Macallan and uh, Glenrothes, both unpeated whiskies. So this is the only, only whiskey. This is the only distillery um, in Kirkwall and it's the only uh, distillery using the Hobbiston more style of peat. So using that quite original treeless peat, really looking at, uh, looking at the fauna and the floral. Um, that's growing on the island. Peat just lingers at the end. It's really lovely. Thanks very much, David. Yeah, like for me personally, like I'm with this company for nearly two years now, and it was really kind of a, a, a whiskey style that I really, really liked to start with. Um, and it was actually kind of one of my original whiskies that brought me into the Scotch category because we all know we've all had those experiences with quite heavy peaty whiskies. And it kind of can be a bit abrasive as an Irish person kind of coming into it. But this was something that really brought me into the category because it had that subtlety. It had that uh, sweetness to it. And it just kind of really kind of lingers with you, but it doesn't overpower from a really good quality style of whiskey. Uh, but even when I'm talking about the barley, the peat that the barley that we actually use on the peating is uh, Lorette barley. And then we kind of mix between an uptick or concerto barley as well within our uh, mash tun. So... Hopefully you all have progressed. Like I said, I don't want to be rushing people here right now, um, but time is of the essence as well. I'm told to try and adhere to my time as quickly as I can and not keep you here for too long. Um, but what's really, really important, and to give you a bit of a story, I would, this is the point where I would say, if you're ready, move on to the 18-year-olds, um, as I can give you a real kind of concept, uh, concept of the barrel policy that we have. Um, so have your noses, have your little taste as I'm talking, and again, we'll talk about it in a little bit. But what's really, really important for us 
as a company, being being an Edrington brand, being a company with McAllen, Highland Park, and um, Glenrothes, we have something quite original with our casks. But to understand Highland Park first is to understand the island and the climate of it. So it is very northerly and it has quite a cold temperate climate, which really adds something to the whiskey. So with, with, with the aging process, we talk about Ireland. If we take Ireland, kind of Scotland as a base level. So where we look at aging, we take aging as say minimum three years, average five. If you look at uh, climate uh, and aging around the world, if you took a Caribbean climate or a tropical climate, they've got three times aging. So if you were to put something in a barrel in, we'll say, Jamaica, it takes, it's three times faster. So a three-year whiskey there is the equivalent of a nine-year whiskey here. So when we go up to Orkney, we're going to the opposite side of things. When we're in, in the Orkney Islands, it's actually slower because the, the, the climate is so much colder and, our, uh, and our, their average temperature throughout the year is so much colder that there's no definitive kind of go as we know with aging, aging really is nature at its best. Like we can break it down into science as much as we want, but it is aging and it is nature at its best. It works about a one and a half times. Sorry, it works about one to a half. So it's kind of actually nearly half as slow as it would take in, on, the, on the main island in Scotland or in Ireland. So this actually, we have to leave it in barrel for longer. But this creates a very, very different style of whiskey. If you take that during the cold, cold winters on the Orkney Islands, we know that um, as aging works, when it gets hotter, the uh, whiskey gets soaked into the wood and it gets colder, it gets pushed out. We are, so obviously, we, we really do have a lot more interaction going on with our barrels because of this um, colder temperature. So as the wood, as, as it gets hotter and the wood soaks up the whiskey when it gets colder, it does hold the whiskey in there a little bit longer as well. So we're getting a bit more interaction actually seed, seeding into the wood itself. So it creates a very different kind of harmonization within our whiskey and gives us a very different style of flavor um, to what you do get from other distilleries. But these barrels become very, very important as well. I was saying, as a company of Edrington, we have one man. And I'm sure as I say this, everybody's going to sit here and kind of go, damn, I'd love to have that man's job. His name is Stuart McPherson. Stuart McPherson is actually uh, what we call our master of wood. He travels the world, um, generally Europe and America, really, uh, searching for casks for Edrington for Highland Park, for um, McAllen and for Glenrothes. And he will travel the world and he will deal with the foresters who are chopping down the trees. He will deal with our cooperages in, uh, in Jerez, in Spain, who are making our barrels. And he actually does that himself. That's his job, is literally just focus on wood. We do have a rum brand as well called, from the Dominican Republic called Brugal that he works for as well. But this guy is literally, his job is focused on wood and that's what he's gonna do for us. And he really understands exactly what he's after. So our, we're also quite different in when we go to our uh, cooperages in Spain and they create our casks. We're one of the companies in the world that actually we rent our barrels, hire our barrels out to the sherry houses where a lot of guys go to the sherry houses and get their barrels. Some of the bigger distilleries like ourselves actually rent our barrels. We get our barrels made, give them to the sherry houses and then take them back to make sure we're going to get that sherry seasoned wood. And that, would, that is what really becomes really apparent within this whiskey is the impact of the wood and the impact of the grains. So when we're looking at using European and American oak, we have two very, very different styles of wood and we're gonna get two very, very different styles of flavor coming through. Now, the 18 year old that we're looking at now is 100% uh, European oak, where the 12 year old that we looked at was majority European oak with, America, with a slight bit of American oak. What that European sherry oak is gonna give us and at that, if you take our climate and at that 18 years in barrel, we're going to get really breaking it down into those into that wood. And the uh, European oak is a little bit broader in its grain. So you get a lot more interaction with the wood where American, if you think kind of trees, you think American forest, European forest, American oak trees are quite slim and quite tall. They've got really close kind of grains in their wood. So the whiskey doesn't create as much of a harmonization or as much of a reaction where European oak, it really gets in. You can see the microscopic looks here where the, the pores in the American wood are quite small compared to the European. This has given us massive interaction with that wood. And we're also only toasting our barrels as well. And in only toasting the barrels, it means that we're only getting really kind of slight. We're not looking for those burnt sugars like you get from bourbons. We're not looking for our vanillas. We're not looking to really get that vanillin kind of flavor through. We're getting really kind of subtle 
um, lighter notes, we're getting our dried fruits, we're getting our sultanas, we're getting our raisins. And that cask caramelization within our stores are very, very important. So looking at our 18 year old, I'd say it's 100% uh, European sherry oak. 45% uh, of them are actually first fill as well. So you're getting something quite different again. And even to allow, to give you an idea, to allow for the temperatures that we're working with in Orkney, we barrel at 69.8% to try, because we've, we've managed to study and maximize what we're going to get out of our wood and how our, what our best um, aging uh, percentage is, best aging ABV is. So we barrel this at 69.8% as well to bring it down to 43%. This is ABV. So again, we're going stronger, same 100% um, European sherry oak. So even on the nose, for me personally, again, I can only speak for myself, it almost comes through a little bit lighter than when we were getting in the 12 year old. You're getting a not more balanced style of flavor, but you're still getting those, uh, those uh, raisins, those sultanas are really become massive for me. And probably the one thing that catches me massively personally with Highland Park is that it does have that bit of peat, but it's not always very evident in the nose. It really comes in the flavor and it comes in its lasting kind of flavor. So, as we take our take our taste, we really see the interaction. The difference in those six years have made, but leaving this in barrel, we're getting a lot bolder flavor. We're getting a lot darker kind of flavors. As you can see the taste in notes there, they're talking about cherries, dark chocolates, toffees. For me personally, I get almost kind of just kind of big bowls, kind of that sherry flavor coming through. I get a little bit of sweetness coming through from the honey and, um, from the head of honey within the peat and I get those bold flavors but I get a sweetness almost like an apple for myself personally. But like if you had asked me about whiskies in the world I would put this in one of my top lists it's just for me personally again I can only speak for myself and it's nothing to do with the fact I work for the brand it really is beautiful it lasts so subtle in its flavor you're getting that bit of peat through, but you're getting a really good full-bodied whiskey. So, let's take a look if anybody has any thoughts. Um, okay, are you nervous about your current peat fields? Is that the end that you might see a subtle change in flavor moving to a new area for the peat? Back and forth, good question. That's always going to be a worry. Now, the guys work in advance as well on this, so they're already looking at what the next are going to be. Now, we're nowhere near um, using up Hobbister more because obviously, like Ireland, there's conservation within its peat bogs, so we just have we can only use it to a certain point and then we need to let it regenerate. Um, but we're no, they've been testing out and they've been looking at the different kind of plots, like in where they can use and they're looking at the subtleties and the differences within it. So it's not a big worry in saying that, oh, we're gonna move here, it's gonna be marked difference. Like it's literally like moving from a field here to a field here side by side. So the, and the, the composition of the island is there isn't really any trees in that area anyway. So you're always, listen, you're always gonna have a subtle difference in the peat anyway, because things settle kind of differently in different layers as uh, things uh, mulch and they break down. You're always gonna have subtle differences no matter whether you're using the same field as to another field. Um, but they have done the work ahead to already keep an eye out to see exactly what they want to do and uh, um, exactly how they want to go with it. And they've ensured that they're always gonna hold on to that taste. We're always obviously looking at a whiskey of over two years as well, where they've been looking at, at creating this all this time. Um, then the next question, are all casts for Highland Park bottlings excluding independent bottlers fully matured in Orkney? Uh, yes. Now, full transparency. Yes, they are fully aged in Orkney, um, but they do get moved down for bottling in a plant in Glasgow where, Highland, where Edgerton do their bottlings. So there is a kind of a, a few months that they're going to spend in Glasgow to be bottled, but all um, all aging, all proper full aging for their 12 to 18 years is done in, uh, on the Orkney Islands. And that's been fully transparent. There are bottling processes taken care of in um, Glasgow, but we do fully age in Orkney. 
And uh, questions just coming through. Any other any other questions there from people? Uh, Paul Cavanagh, toffee apple nose. Yeah, really. Like, and it's there's always kind of we'll say official kind of um, tasting notes and everything. And apple is never really in them. But for me personally, I get apple, and it's amazing how we all taste and we all taste differently and we get different things out of it. But that kind of toffee apple is a really big thing for me. Uh, Donald Higgins, price points on the eighteen year old. Uh, 18 year old, if you were to buy it from uh, Mulligan's Whiskey Shop, it's 175 euro. And the 12 year old, um, I'm actually just checking the price myself on that off the top of my head. Uh, 12 year old, I believe, is about 75, but do not quote me on that. I'm actually literally just checking their website right now to see if I can just be certain about this um, because it wasn't up on the website when I was checking before this because I knew this question was coming and I can't seem to find it right now. It should be around the 75, 80, 80 euro mark. But the 18 year old is 175 uh, from Mulligan's on their website. And um, later on this evening as well, we're going to be coming back on. We're going to get to taste something very, very special for uh, uh, the guys in Mulligan's and Michael, where we have a special single cask that's been released especially to Mulligan's. Um, so that single cask, we're going to do that tasting later on. It's going to be really interesting, very special. Michael, as a massive, massive fan of Highland Park for himself, was ecstatic to be able to get his hands on this and to be able to. So later on, I will be back with you um, in one of the uh, in one of the open rooms in which we can actually taste the single cast as well. Even I haven't got it went straight to Michael. I haven't got a chance myself to even try it. So I'm excited myself to give it a go and see exactly. I have all the information on it, but uh, how it actually tastes. You know, you can read everything, but to taste it is always so much bigger and so much more important. And it was a, it was really, we were really happy to be able to do that with Michael because he's been such a big supporter of the brand. Anybody have any other questions there, guys? Um, or girls, sorry, now. Just gonna double check with you if you have anything else. Sorry, now there's people just still coming in right there. Okay. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything else in the chat there. Uh, if anybody does have anything, if anybody has any questions, uh, is it easy to visit Distillery of Paul? Yeah, it is actually. Well, okay. There is a distillery tour. You can visit the distillery. The Orkney Islands themselves are a little bit harder to get to. Um, it is one of the dodgiest flights you might ever have in your life. It's a tiny, tiny little kind of, um, I, I'm trying to think of the description. It's like, it's, a, it's, a, it's an outboard two engine plane, but like it fits very few people on the plane. And they, if you get a bad, you're not going. Uh, there is a ferry as well as well to get to that, but it's really weather dependent as well. Trying to get out there is quite difficult sometimes. There has been times where they've been bringing people out and they've had to cancel it just due to weather. But uh, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous island. And I'd recommend to anybody if they ever got a, if they ever got a chance to go, uh, definitely to go. Um, how would you compare the 10 year old to the 12 year old Ellen and Ian? Uh, the 10 year old is lighter in its flavor. Um, you can see the difference really up with six years making the 12 and the 18. The 10 year old is lighter in its flavor. It comes through a little bit more peaty and doesn't have as much as the barrel impact that you think. Like it's only a two year difference, but that two years makes a massive difference in the end. Um, so you're getting a little, you're getting a little bit more sweetness, but you are you, you're you can see between the twelve and the eighteen kind of the harmonisation that happens and the real roundness that comes in the body. The ten year old is missing that. It has if if you're like kind of more of a younger aged, it is really really good. And um, like for me personally, it's the twelve and the eighteen is one of my favourites. Twelve is a really good kind of I say as we go to an entry level, um, but it is. It, it, the ten is lovely. It's it's not as round in its flavour. It's not as bold in its barrel notes. It's uh, it, there's a lot more American oak going into it as well than there is European oak. So you're not. You, it's very different. But it is. I'm trying to be very careful as well about insulting a brand that I actually work. But um, it is. I'm not trying to insult at all. It's a, it is a lovely whiskey, but it's quite different when you're tasting the twelve and the eighteen to go down to the ten. How popular would the whiskey be around the islands? They, they embody this whiskey. The Orkney Islands. They're their heart and their soul is about their Viking culture and they, 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 they are what they call themselves modern day Vikings and they really embody this brand and it's all about, it's everything that they're about. If you ever wanted to see like a real kind of community spirit around something like that, it'd be one of the bigger employers in the islands as well and they have a massive, massive grow and love for this brand. Uh, Paul, you'd love to visit the island. Uh, yeah, it's, it is amazing. It's definitely in you and they're saying it's on your bucket list. Uh, it's amazing. If there's anything, if you're ever going, um, don't be afraid to reach out as well if there's anything we can do to help 
uh, anything we can do to kind of, if it's even just to kind of get the best of information on that, when the days to get there or when to get there, don't be afraid to get in touch with us. Um, as the Vikings would say themselves, Scal, which would be cheers. Um, and my own kind of handle is down there. If anybody does any, if you have any questions any further, um, if you are ever going near the distillery, you're coming from Ireland, they'll only be delighted to have you. So please don't be afraid to reach out and let us know, even through Michael as well. Don't be afraid to pop into the guys in Mulligans and um, have a talk with them. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your time. I don't want to hold you too long. Um, I know you've got plenty more to do and I will see you later on. Thank you very much.